So I'm really excited to announce the next session. So even though the, the title of this session is Risk Management um, in Commercializing uh, Robots, but uh, I think an alternate title, title for this uh, session is, is called Free Legal Advice. Uh, no, exactly. just, ki just kidding, there's no legal advice. Uh, you're not getting legal advice um, here. But we're, we're, I'm really delighted to have um, you know, two uh, a very uh, forward-looking, uh, very experienced uh, practitioners at the highest level of technology loss, right? So I mean, I think many of you uh, have, have met um, uh, Stephen uh, before, Stephen Wu, uh, who has been thinking about this, uh, the, really sort of where the rubber meets the road when it comes to robotics and law for years now, and had a, a leadership role within the American Bar Association where he was the uh, uh, head of the science and technology section of the entire Bar Association, and has, and has been just a great um, uh, booster uh, and, and, and mentor to us. Um, but you may actually not, uh, not met uh, Julie Martin yet. Um, of course, I've known uh, Julie for, for some time now, um, and she's very well known in the, in the, the other space that I operate in which, is in, which is in privacy law, but, but new to us in robotics here. Um, but we're really, really um, uh, delighted to have uh, Julie, who is a, a, a practitioner here in, in the Bay Area in private practice and helps um, startups and other kinds of companies uh, think through all kinds of interesting technology policy issues. And previous to this, um, Julie was uh, Associate General Counsel of Mozilla, um, and I'm sure she's going to tell us a little a bit about that. I think, interestingly, at a time when she was doing a lot of intermediary liability and privacy work, but they also had a couple of real live robots running around uh, in, in, uh, in, at Mozilla at the time, and so she's no stranger to that. Um, and so, you know, with that, I'm going to leave you in, in Julie's capable hands and just say thanks to you both. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, I think to start off, um, Stephen's going to give us a little context in terms of some of the framework, and then I'll dive into this. Um, and then we're going to do a little bit of a robotic exchange where I think I'll be the voice and he's going to be the hands in terms of doing the slides. So I'm not sure how coordinated they'll be, but bear with us. All right, so he's going to set us up with a little context here to get us rolling. Sherlock Holmes was considered one of the greatest fictional detectives in, in literature. And he had a strong expertise in being able to investigate a crime after after a murder has taken place, ferret out the evidence and find out who actually committed the crime, un expose the perpetrator, and find the truth. But an interesting uh, question in my mind is, uh, what about the possibility as portrayed in um, this movie here, uh, Minority Report, where uh, a, a Washington, D.C. detective named John Anderton was able to work with a team of police detectives to catch the perpetrators of murders before the murders took place. So wh what I'm thinking today is that when we talk about product liability for robotics, that wouldn't it be great if we could look into the future and say there will be cases filed in the future, there will be accidents, but are there things that we can do today to win the cases for tomorrow's uh, lawsuits when the accident hasn't even occurred and the lawsuit hasn't even been filed. And the message of the paper is, yes, we should be prepared today for the cases of tomorrow. And there are things that companies can do to be able to prepare for those cases now so that they can put them in the, themselves in the best position to win those cases tomorrow. All right, so with that, um, let me give you a little overview of how we're planning to use the time here. We're gonna start, I'm gonna go through and summarize some of the points in Steve's paper and highlight um, some of the valuable advice that he provides. I'll then give a short comment period of some things that I was thinking in response to it and bring my perspective and then we'll have a response from Steve to that and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So let's start and I wanted to add a little more background about Steve because I think it's really helpful in understanding his paper and some of the value that it provides. And when I talked to Steve last week, he mentioned himself as a Main Street lawyer and tech actually uh, literally works on Main Street in Los Altos and has a practice that involves both litigation and other forms of counseling. And I think it's really useful to mention that because I think a lot of the advice here, as Ryan also mentioned, has value from that perspective of, of working with real live companies on the ground floor, both in a litigation context and uh, in more of a counseling mode. So with that, let's dive into his paper. So 
As Ryan mentioned, it's titled Risk Management and Commercializing Robots. In terms of some of the high level structure, I think as I read it, the perspective was, as I mentioned, from a practicing attorney with experience in both the courtroom and as a counselor, and I think that's one of the things that I really appreciated and, and found helpful about the paper. The question posed seems to be, what is the fundamental issue facing a general counsel of a robotics company? What is the thing that keeps you up at night? What is that non-starter that may keep you in the gate and prevent your technology from ever getting to market? And in the paper, the answer that Steve presents is massive tort liability and a big jury verdict. Uh, the goal in the paper is how do you advise companies or to advise companies on how to minimize that product liability exposure using a best practices approach? And the main best practice technique that's detailed and described is risk management methodology. That's sort of my high level. Hopefully, he hasn't hit me yet, so hopefully that's so far so, so far so that's good. Absolutely All right. good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in terms of some of the more detailed sections, let's go through. I think Steve starts out and does a great job of presenting some of the legal theories of liability that can come up. And I know some of the other panels have talked about this as well. I think, you know, there's a whole range of theories that you could be facing if there's a product liability issue. And they could be strict liability, implied warranties, consumer protection law. But I think the takeaway for me from that section was there are plenty of hooks. So if you have a problem, if there's a product malfunction that injures property or people, there are lots of different legal vehicles to bring that case to court. If I could interrupt, one of the things that I found interesting was that uh, a practitioner with which we did a program, Ryan and I did a program in the past, mentioned that a lot of the plaintiff's bar is now interested in less the uh, cases brought after accidents, but the cases brought on behalf of consumers for the diminution in the value of the product that they purchased. So some of the statutory claims mentioned by Julie are actually at the forefront of, say, if you look at the Toyota a sudden acceleration complaint, that has to do with the, the I bought this car, it was, I thought it was worth this much, I paid this much, but it was actually worth some lower amount, so the delta between the two is the measure of damages. So looking at those theories of liability, what are some of the consequences of having a product liability issue? And the paper looks at a couple big high profile cases. First, the Pinto case, I think it's got slides, where there was a jury verdict of $125 million and also the Viox case, which had a verdict of $235 million from the jury. Um, and a big part of, of the paper is that Steve looked at the reason for big jury verdicts and argued that it was juror anger, stating that when juries become angry, the only way that they, can, that they see they can redress the defendant's wrong is to render very large verdicts against them in an effort to send a message that their conduct is unacceptable. And part of what happened, um, as the paper describes in, for example, the Pinto case, was the jury was able to see evidence of the cost-benefit analysis that Pinto went through and the valuation it gave for human life in exchange for the trade-offs of safety. Um, similarly, in Viox, there was evidence and documentation that made Merck seem very callous and profit-driven to lead it to maybe not be as transparent as it could have been. All right, so with that in mind, Steve then lays out, and this is sort of the, the free legal advice, but not really legal advice <laughs> in terms of disclaimers. You know, what are some of the strategies? What do you do? So say you are that general counsel or you're an entrepreneur and you're interested, you're not deterred, you wanna go forward, you think you've got something of value and you can make the world a better place with your robot. Well, there are a number of ways you can address this, as you'll find out, as you should have this handy paper with you. Um, the first is obviously there are trial techniques. So you can have jury consultants and you can hire good lawyers and you can do all that stuff. But as Steve talked about in the intro too, that kind of a reactive approach is probably not the best. It's a little bit outdated and you're gonna be much better off if you can be proactive. And not only is it better to avoid cases, but in the event that you do end up with one, it's gonna help you there too. One of the, the specific piece of, 
pieces of advice he offers, which I really like, is go beyond what is required and what's industry practice. Don't just do the bare minimum because that's a legal requirement or that's industry practice. Go above and beyond and be able to document it so that later, if you do have a problem, you can pull that up and show that you were a responsible company that really wanted to do the best by your products and by your customers. And specifically for any law students in the crowd, uh, Steve mentions that using the hypothetical reasonable person is not a very compelling argument to jurors. So it may have a lot of importance within 100 yards of here, 500 yards, but doesn't really make a lot of sense to jurors. Um, and then as I mentioned in the introduction, a big portion of the paper goes through risk management methodology, which is a concept used in a number of areas, but has applicability here. And basically it's a set of practices that takes a comprehensive look at your business, your technology, and does a, a thorough view of identifying your risks and then managing them. And there are standards and organizations that specialize the, in this, and Steve mentions in particular ISO 31000, um, and also the fact that compliance with the standard, although as we mentioned, you don't want to do the bare minimum, it does have benefit, not only in providing a framework for how to think about it, but also if you are in litigation. It, it just, just as a side point, it, I, I'm guessing, and I haven't done any empirical studies about this, but I'm guessing that a lot of the problems that have occurred that, that created accidents that caused lawsuits had to do with people falling, or companies having products that fell below even the minimum standards. So if you could just bring yourself up to the minimum, that in and of itself is tremendous progress. Right. All right, a couple other things that are mentioned are some of the non-traditional risks that exist. One of them being information security risk. So in this case, imagine someone hacking into or um, injecting a virus into your autonomous car, telling it to run a red light or run into that pole. Uh, obviously not a good situation. Another one being supply chain threats, which have gotten a lot of attention of late, um, including in the US government, a lot of uh, consumer electronics manufacturers around here. I know I have client, uh, one client in particular who's a big consumer electronics company, and now there's a lot more focus going into supply chain security. They make sure there are certain clauses that go in every supply agreement to address this and make sure all their suppliers are addressing it. And same thing would apply here as with any consumer electronics or other electronics product. It's something you want to think about. Yeah, the, the, this was from the GAO report. This is a, a, a picture of a laptop, and what it's saying is, common suppliers for various components of laptop devices can be found in all of these countries. And it's just a list of all, of all these countries. And so it just goes to show you how widely dispersed the sources of supplies are. Right. And so basically when you're looking at your product liability, the source of risk is quite broad in this context. So, all right, so that's some manufacturing strategies. On the juror strategy side, uh, Steve provides a number of tips and suggestions, including participation in standards or industry groups, purchasing pools to promote, to sort of pool your leverage in negotiating with manufacturers to do the right thing on their side in terms of designs and manufacturing processes, uh, information sharing groups that may be on a more um, informal basis to share best practices, joining specialty bar groups such as the one that Steve created at the ABA, hiring juror consultants, and having good document manage management practices. So in summary, uh, Steve's paper presents a variety of best practices and strategies for minimizing the likelihood of a catastrophic accident and the inevitable product liability case that may follow if you enrage jurors to anger. Um, so with that, I'll provide a little bit of, of response and thoughts and then we'll let let Steve respond. So I think first off, sort of as Ryan mentioned, I think it's a really valuable paper. It's uh, part of what I liked about it was it's very practical. It's based on real life experience and it's specific in terms of its suggestions. So I think it's really helpful for anyone in this space. You know, legal advice is expensive. So all joking aside, it's not easy to get uh, good lawyers thinking about these kinds of issues and have 
the ability to sit down and get their thoughts on how to address some of these things. So as a startup in particular, it can be really valuable to have this sort of insight at your fingertips. So I think that's, it's a really valuable thing to add to this space. Um, I think it's also helpful in that regard as well because it's digestible by a broad spectrum of people. It's not written in a super technical or super legalistic uh, perspective. It's really digestible for entrepreneurs, for lawyers, um, for academics, for anybody interested in the space. So those are all um, additional pluses and I would highly recommend if you haven't read it already that uh, you do. In terms of things that I would look at to add um, additional value for future iterations, because we know Steve isn't going to give up on robots anytime soon, at least we certainly hope he doesn't. Um, the first, and as, as Ryan mentioned, you know, I mentioned I think a big part of the value here is that Steve brings his experience and perspective, and I think where I come from, a lot of the issues I look at in my practice are around privacy and data security, and so I think really looking at how that plays out here is important. Um, I think switching hats in some way from, I mentioned the, the article looks at it from what, what is the general counsel going to be thinking about late at night or what's going to get her up early in the morning <coughs> worried about her company, it's the product liability issues. I think one of the other hats is as a customer looking to buy or incorporate ro uh, robots, what, are, what is that general counsel going to be thinking about? And what are they going to be demanding in negotiations and wanting to talk to your engineers or your business people about to make sure you've thought through? And I think currently one of those big issues is privacy and data security. Um, in terms of specific examples, as Ryan mentioned, I was at Mozilla when uh, we did a pilot with Willow Garage, which I know is public. <coughs> And that is exactly what I talked to them about. You know, there are a number of issues that come up. What we had, someone mentioned to me, there's a number of products. This was the Texi robot, which is the telepresence. And so some of the natural issues that flow out of that from a privacy perspective is how, what's going to happen to all that data you're recording? You know, we've got a number of obligations. If I'm sitting in on one of those meetings and my engineer in Toronto is on that robot, what happens to attorney-client privilege. I need to make sure that the data that that robot is recording doesn't get shared with anybody else because I don't want to waive that privilege. Um, it's not as much of an issue for Mozilla, but for a lot of places, trade secrets are an issue. And under California trade secret law, if you don't take steps to ensure that your trade secrets aren't shared with third parties, you lose that trade secret. Um, so that's another reason you want to make sure to address confidentiality. And additionally, you may have NDAs or other things that require you to take steps to restrict the flow of your data with third parties. Um, in addition, there's, if there's a data breach, all the information that's recorded there would be of concern because as the employer, you may have, or it, it may flow also to your customers, liability for any breach that results from your use of that. Um, I think another practical consequence of that as a customer is there are a number of sub-technologies that go into robots that all raise additional privacy concerns, such as facial recognition technology, location tracking, and because robots are so sophisticated, they pull together a lot of these different technologies, all of which raise their own privacy issues, uh, including you know, what's going to be shared with governments and third parties, including your vendors. So I think currently we're seeing, at least I'm seeing in my practice, um, a huge uptick in interest in privacy and data security issues. I think even just two or three years ago, it was hard to get um, parties and negotiations to really take it seriously and look at how you're going to allocate liability, what sort of steps were being taken around uh, data security. And now everybody comes to the table knowing that's going to be a big issue. So I think failure to address privacy and data security would limit adoption of robots and increase liability. And one of the reasons I think it's important is it it's not a remote possibility. It's really an immediate concern for a lot of companies. So I think talking, adding a section or some <coughs> consideration, or maybe it's part of another provision. Paper to, here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
that really looks at privacy by design, which I think there was some discussion yesterday about as well. Um, and actually, the framework that you have in your paper around risk management methodology is a good framework also for privacy. It's taking, because privacy really is one of those beginning to end processes and taking a comprehensive look is really valuable. Um, the, other, the other comment I had, and then I'll let you respond to both, um, is sort of looking at the role of juror anger in terms of some of these verdicts. And I think the paper considers the cause of big verdicts to be juror anger. And I would suggest that maybe the cause of big verdicts is corporate malfeasance. And so it's a little bit different perspective <laughs> <laughs> or political approach. Uh, but I think typically, there are a couple thoughts I had on that. I mean, one is I think jurors won't really get angry unless there's evidence of something going on that seems inappropriate. And I think one of the disconnects, and I don't know all the details, but in the Pinto case, I would guess that part of what got people upset was not that there was a balancing of cost-benefit, because there always is, right? You could buy a Volvo, which has more safety, but people don't. It costs more money, so everybody's making those trade-offs, and we could drive in the Pope Mobile, but we don't. Um, but I think part of it is what valuation was given to life and how much regard was given to how many people would die and at what cost could that have been traded off. Um, I think one of the, the interesting parallels is if we look at the fact that there are big jury verdicts coming out in a number of areas, including patent litigation, that it's not always um, big sensational facts that drive that, but sort of a view of valuation and the fact that a lot of these corporations are making lots and lots of money and, and there it's part of the, to use more of a law and economics analysis, sort of re requiring them to internalize the costs of the decisions they're making. So. Um, like I said, it's sort of a smaller point, but I think it, just a difference in perspective. Um, and I guess part of the message, which I think comes out in the paper too, is, it, which is a little bit different spin though in terms of the role of juror anger, more that it's the right thing to do to have a safer product and to look at to, um, to prioritize safety is legally and ethically a good thing to do. So those are my thoughts. Hard to find anything on such a good paper. Like I said, I think it's really valuable for folks and uh, to get someone with this kind of practical experience being willing to step back and say, okay, let me look at how I would approach this whole industry and some of the things people can do. So I'll let you okay, respond. Well, thank you very much, Julie. Appreciate you going through the paper like that. Um, I see in the first things that you were talking about in terms of the privacy and data security, another paper, which I probably will <laughs> write on the back end of this, but um, uh, going further into the corporate malfeasance, um, I had assumed in writing the paper that the readers of the paper would want to do the right thing. And so a lot of the thrust is making robots safer and, and including within that the environment and the infrastructure around robots. So when we talk about autonomous driving, for example, if we're talking about uh, coordination among vehicles, there's a whole infrastructure piece on the, on the other end where there would be communications between vehicles and infrastructure and servers and computers on, on that end where they're uh, taking in information, understanding the traffic patterns or an accident has occurred and being able to communicate that to other vehicles so that people know how to route around the accidents and all those kinds of things. And what that means is it's not just a robot, a single system in isolation, it's an entire system. And the entire system needs to be secured. The entire system needs to value privacy. So, you know, keeping that in mind. But uh, going uh, further, I, I think that what, what, I, what the main thrust of this was to make sure that companies are prepared today for the lawsuits of tomorrow and thinking about how to make robots safer and, th and therefore, because of that safety, minimizing the risk of a big verdict. Um, in terms of your discussion about the Ford Pinto, um, you were talking about the jurors were maybe turned off by this giving a certain valuation to a uh, human life. Uh, it's interesting that the Ford folks found that valuation or received that valuation from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So that's where they got the information. And when I read through the materials, my sense of it really was that it was the disparity between the value of a human life and the fact that the part that could have fixed this was worth $11. 
In other words, if they had just added $11 to the cost of the car, they could have saved all these lives. And the fact that Ford wasn't even willing to spend the 11 bucks was really something that hit the jury pretty hard. And do you know, what was the cost of moving the gas tank up? Because that was I, a separate calculus, That was a separate right? so calculus. Yes, yeah, so there were two options that, that you're referring to. One, um, one is to move the, the gas tank forward a little bit to have it a little more prepared but, uh, for an accident. But what uh, I'm talking about in terms of the 11 bucks is a, a what they called a bladder that fit around the gas tank. So if there was some kind of puncturing that the bladder would have prevented a leak. And so it, it was the $11 part was the bladder. And that was a, an easy fix. And I think the jury said, you knew about the problem, you didn't do anything about the problem, and you could have spent 11 bucks per car, which we surely would have been able to reach into our wallets and be able to pay for, and you didn't do it. That's what I think really hit them. Uh, the, the other thing, too, is um, when I think about uh, juries, too, uh, it, it, when I was a law student, it seemed like winning a case is all about finding great appellate precedents because you're doing this mock trial in your first year of law school. You're arguing at the appellate level, so it's all about finding great case precedents. And if you can find some authorities that your opponent didn't find, then you'll win your case. And then as a law firm lawyer, I realized, no, it's all about the facts. It's all about investigating what really happened and finding out, finding out the truth. And, and that's what it's really all about. And then as I became a more senior lawyer, it was really about finding out who's telling the truth. And then I would add on, you know, because like the rules of evidence, seem, uh, a lot of them seem to be oriented towards ferreting out truth from lies. So the credibility of your client is critical. If you have the facts on your side, but your client comes off like a liar or has prior inconsistent statements or seemed to have been lied, uh, had been lying in the past, a judge is going to instruct the jury, you can disregard this witness's testimony entirely if you believe, it's, if you believe this witness is untruthful or you could just believe part of it. The judge is going to tell the jury straight out. So if your client doesn't come off as credible, then you, you have a real problem with your case. Uh, even if you have the facts on your side. So it's a combination of the facts and, and the credibility of your clients. But I would add to it is I think jurors have a sense of right and wrong, that they want to go with their gut on that. And the, uh, as much as the judges like to instruct the, the juries on exactly the letter of the law, there's this strong sense of they're trying to do the right thing. And they don't like the sense that companies would be putting profits over people's lives. And that certainly came out in the Vioxx materials because the, the people who were interviewed afterwards on the jury were saying, we really felt that these guys knew about the problem, and yet they went full speed ahead in marketing it, the drug anyway, and the people who were in, in charge and management didn't seem to be listening to the people who were finding out these adverse results. So one of the things I go through is, when you have bad information that is uh, being gathered or, or comes to uh, employees of the company, the idea is not to suppress that information and try to deep six it. It is to make sure that that information uh, is properly reported and that management considers that information and acts on it in some way. And that act might be saying, oh, you know, thank you for bringing this to my attention. We've now implemented these controls in order to mitigate the risk of that vulnerability that you've pointed out to us. So there's a, a, a process of closing the loop to make sure that there is some documented steps to account for that vulnerability. But if there's some decision not to go forward, at least there's a decision, here's why we didn't go forward with this decision. And that can come to be helpful evidence in a defense of a case later on. Okay. Uh, one thing I was hoping we could get Steve's perspective on is if you could talk for a few minutes about your motivation in writing the paper and your interest in this field, and then we'll open it up to broader questions. Yep. So uh, the motivation is uh, Ryan and I had been putting on some continuing legal education conferences, and I've been a speaker at some other con uh, continuing education conferences where people are asked, why do you think, wh or what do you think is the major challenge involved in uh, commercializing robotics technology? And all the audience members seem to say, it's about the law. We're worried about getting sued. We don't want to have a big verdict against us. So I wrote the paper to address specifically that threat and the audience for the paper is those folks who are worried about rolling out robotics technology and getting sued. So that was the main motivation. And then this, another uh, idea I had in my mind is to say, well, if I'm doing a risk analysis as the general counsel of the company and I don't like those big verdicts, 
well, wh what's the core cause of that? Well, the core cause of it is all the juror uh, anger from the uh, uh, conduct of the, the, the manufacturer uh, at the time that the product was being developed. Um, and also then saying, well, here, what are some things that manufacturers can do to look at other types of risks that they may not be aware of? Because I mentioned some of the problems that, that engineers would certainly be aware of, like engineering problems or human factors, uh, inatten uh, inatten uh, inattention to the robot or fatigue or the environmental factors. I mentioned that GM case where GM had actually put a, uh, an auto manufacturing robot in an unsafe location and then disabled the security, uh, the, the security lockout so that uh, somebody couldn't get into an accident. I mean, those are environmental factors. Um, and so those are the usual suspects of defects or problems that would uh, cause accidents. But people aren't so much thinking about information security threats. They should be, or the supply chain problem. They should be. So I wanted to bring that to people's attention. And then to say, OK, from a records management perspective, what do we want to say about how you can develop a record of your safety? Uh, the, there was a really interesting article that I reference in, in my article in which the author says that the lack of documents can make a difference in a case. If you don't have the evidence as a manufacturer to support the safety of your processes, you essentially are handicapped when it comes to the defense of your case. So that's why you need to be building that documentation today for the cases of tomorrow. Yeah, so this is, this is just great. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I know there's some uh, roboticists here, actually, uh, at least a couple. And, uh, and I know that there are others either watching on the live stream or will be watching on the videos later on. And I think this is going to be a very helpful tool for them. Um, and so as a person who likes robots and wants them to come to market, uh, I think general advice about how to mitigate risk, it's really great for these folks to have that. And so I really appreciate it from that perspective. But I want to ask Ian's question from yesterday, which is basically, what's unique here about robotics, right? And so I actually have a couple of candidates, um, you know, one of which is, um, on the, the privacy side, for instance, right? So if you buy a tab, Mozilla buys a tablet, sort of counterfactually, they buy a tablet, they give it to all their employees. Well, you know, you think about the trade secret issues and, you know, how, how does the employee manual govern those kinds of things, right? Um, versus there's a robot kind of, you know, weirdly moving around in my space and I don't know if it's on or not and it's looking over my shoulder and it makes me feel uncomfortable. Who's on the other end of that robot, right? And there's a sort of discomfort or let's say that I'm, that, that I'm actually telecommuting into Mozilla from elsewhere. So Layla's group at, at Willow Garage has shown that people have formed sort of certain expectations around how, they'll be, how their telepresence um, a robot will be treated by others and they think of it almost as an extension of the body and, and I think the conclusion, and she can correct us if I'm wrong here, uh, was almost that it's almost like a, the way a person feels about a wheelchair, like you don't touch someone's wheelchair. Right, um, and so I, I wonder if you thought of it. Those are these are unique, you know, or, or the, the conversation from this morning that um, that was so informative from Judge Carno about sort of the complexity issue, um, or the fact that for the first time we've combined an open system. We talked about this yesterday um, with the ability to do physical damage, right? So I wonder, do you want to sort of talk about robot-specific risks and how to how to deal with them to the extent that you? I know that you have views on that, right? Okay, I'll answer first and. Um, I guess I would say, to some extent, I don't think they are unique issues. I mean, I would, I would take the position that it's an important issue to look at any time there's data collection. So whether it's your ISP or your co-location facility or CDNs, all those kinds of vendors you work with, you should be looking at data security and privacy issues. Um, so in some sense, that's good news because robotics companies aren't unique in being in this position. Um, but I would say, to your question about what are some of the unique issues, I think whether they're valid or not in every case will depend, but I think there is a scope issue of how much information is gathered. So, for example, in the, the telepresence kind of robot, um, you've got audio and video and location, and sort of like I mentioned, some of those sub-technologies which can add layers of data collection that may not exist in more traditional um, technology. So I think to some extent the scope might be broader, but the issues themselves are not unique to robotics in my view. Comfort you feel about technology not Well question had to do with discomfort yeah, around the robotics I mean, I think, technology. 
I think it's interesting. It makes me think of what you've written in terms of the visceral responses of people. Like, I think what I like about the robotics case is it may force people to look at things that they should be looking at in other cases. So I think part of why I didn't mention the discomfort is, to me, if you look at it objectively, you can look at the technologies, what are the data flows, what are the risks, it shouldn't be any worse, right? Whether or not you touch someone shouldn't matter with whether they're in a wheelchair. For the same reason, it shouldn't be different because it's a robot. It may be, and it may um, raise issues that people wouldn't otherwise think about, but I think if you look at it more from that risk management methodology and objectively in terms of what the data flows are, it shouldn't be unique for robots, even though it probably is. Well, I agree with everything Julie said. Uh, I would also say that uh, robots are collecting all those different types of data all in one device, whereas you, I, I know like GPS manufacturers, they're getting subpoenas all the time for information on where so-and-so customer was located at what time. So those kinds of things are happening already, but all of a sudden now you've got this device that has the GPS, has the video, has the audio, all in one device. Uh, I would also say that uh, things uh, that might be specific to robots is going to your point about the wheelchair. I think we're going to be building up over the coming decades cultural norms or uh, it will be part of our culture to interact with robots in certain ways. It will be seen as polite in some ways and, and impolite as others. Um, and then the visceral reaction might be something that might trigger a duty to warn. If, if people have uh, adverse visceral reactions to certain types of robots, then maybe we need to have some more human factors engineering going into it or some duty to warn people who are using the device or around the device about its operation to try to prevent uh, accidents from occurring. Um, and then also, I think about the uncertainty that Judge Carno was talking about and the problem of forensics as it relates to the investigation of what happened in an accident. The forensics is going, we'll have, we'll have to have a new field of forensics <laughs> talking about uh, trying to find out the, 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 the problems that occurred uh, that led to an accident uh, and trying to figure out exactly what were the causes so that we can do the calculation of the comparative fault I think is going to be a, a whole nother challenge that we'll have to deal with. One thing I wanted to add on the, the discomfort, I think the discomfort people feel about the scope of data collected was pretty evident in the Tesla issue that came up recently when people started realizing how much data a car can collect. And it wasn't even necessarily a robotics issue, but it's related. And if you take the autonomous driving situation, it's only going to up it. But I think there definitely is more of a visceral reaction. And I think one of the things I've thought about over the years, and actually spoke about location on Capitol Hill a few years ago, one of the things that people struggle with in the privacy space is how to make it real. And I think the one thing that people can relate to that they understand quickly why privacy is important is when people know their location and can track them. And so I think, one, there's, there's that element in some of these cases, and there's also um, that more physical, visceral response when you can see Oh. Oh, yes. uh, first of all, thank you. This is a great discussion. Uh, I have two quick questions. One, if a risk is assessed internally and then determined to be so unlikely that you're not actually going to do anything about it, it's brought up, it's a possibility, but it's not actually going to be acted on, do you think that documenting that uh, and if it actually occurs will play well or against a company if it's brought up in a lawsuit? The accident actually occurs for that reason. You knew about it, but you didn't take any uh, corrective action because you thought it was absurd or unlikely. And two, um, what do you think about proactive discussions or communication with regulators at the state and federal level once you've done your risk assessment? Uh, the first question concerning unlikely risks, uh, there is always uh, an uncertainty when it comes to how a jury is going to react to certain information, so that would be the, the caveat. Um, but I would say that you have the, the pros of documenting that risk is to say, well, we considered it, and here's why we think it's unlikely. And I think that that, as a net-net, is going to be a benefit to the defense, as opposed to just not considering it or not documenting it at all. I mean, some, a plaintiff's lawyer could say, hey, you knew about this risk, and yet you didn't do anything about it. I mean, that's, that's the obvious argument. But um, by having the documentation there that was created contemporaneously at the time that the risk was being assessed, as opposed to after the fact when an expert is looking at, 
at causes and say, oh, that risk was unlikely, so you know, that's why they didn't consider it. The fact that it was a record created at the time of the design, I think, is going to provide s some additional credibility. So net-net, I think it's a positive. Uh, and then in terms of uh, proactive discussions with regulators, I think there's some that's going to be mandatory, so it may be a, a necessary thing that you, you don't really have any choice about doing. Um, I think the fact that, uh, then the second thought I had was the fact that the company is going out and proactively trying to find out, hey, what are you hearing in terms of what other companies are experiencing in terms of accidents and uh, risks? You, we want to know. I mean, that really sh sh is another piece of evidence to show the company's commitment to safety. So I think it's net-net a good thing. Uh, first minor point related to that, uh, companies can actually find themselves discouraging employees from necessarily suggesting things that might be safety related because they don't want to necessarily have to have discussed whether that particular thing was a good idea or not. And I don't know if there's an easy way around that. I doubt there is. But I want to get to the main point, which is something a lot of us are interested in, which is cars. And the issue I'd really like to see discussed is the really the really big difference in terms of companies are going to, in the future, make decisions to release products. Perhaps they've demonstrated that they're twice as good as human drivers, for example, and thus would cause a reduction in accidents. That's still making a conscious decision to release a product that if it were deployed across the whole world would kill 500,000 people every year. That actually would be pretty bad for a nuclear bomb manufacturer. They haven't managed to kill 500,000 people with their product yet. Um, so how do, you, how do you have a situation where you're going to make a decision to release, release a product that you know is going to kill some large number of people? Uh, and you debate to delay it would be to have more people killed by other parties, by the, the humans who are driving instead of the software. Um, has anyone ever had to sit in that situation in robotics? I'm not sure. And how can we color our thinking with that sort of uh, concern to look at? Yeah, my sense of it is that this, this has to have come up, you know, in other cases. I haven't done, you know, research or literature searches in terms of finding precedents for that, but uh, we've talked in other conferences that, that Ryan has put on about that very issue. Yeah. We've said, look, if we roll out autonomous driving technology, we're going to have X number of excess deaths, some amount, but yet we're going to save all these lives. So from a societal perspective, we should be doing this because of all the lives we're going to save. The problem is, in any particular case, the focus is going to be on these cases and say, was there a defect in the vehicle that caused this accident to cause damages to this person? But some of the tests that go in terms of trying to define whether the robot was defective or the, the vehicle was defective, I think can take that into account to some extent, and there's a story to tell to a jury as to why this product is not unreasonably dangerous, and pointing to the fact that it saves all these lives, and that's why it's designed in a certain way, but despite the fact that it saved all these lives, we had this incident that occurred in this one very, very unusual case. Well, but I mean, we probably, let's just stipulate, though, that it's, it's a clear def defect, a mistake, a programming bug, no question about it, that the company made a decision that the software is so complex that history shows that software of that complexity will have some number of bugs in it, and this is, this is well understood. But nonetheless, we've got a, a very clear error on someone's part, possibly some negligence involved in it, and we have injury at the end of it. And again, and a deliberate decision to release a product knowing that that will happen without knowing the specifics necessarily of what will happen. I just didn't know how much precedent there was for that. I think that if you had a clear bug like that, that's when, um, that's when you look to the documentation that you've created all during the design process to try to ferret out bugs and make sure that you don't have it in the first place. We know that one came through and so caused the accident in this case, and that's where you're probably counseling your client to say, this is probably a case we need to settle. Oh, yeah, no, settlement's not an issue, actually. I'm sure that there'll be settlement offers quite easily in those cases. It's punitive damages and uh, high damages, which would be the issue. So. Well, you know, you, you try to document the best you can, all the steps you, you took to try to have a uh, secure uh, design and to ferret out bugs in the design process of the software, um, and, and you're trying to show that you took reasonable care to try to prevent this. There's always going to be maybe even a zero-day attack where somebody comes up with a vulnerability that you were unaware of during the design process, and it was one of these things that was not reasonably foreseeable, and y y we tried our best, but it, it came through in that case. And, you know, that, I, I think trying to document those kinds of efforts to try to prevent bugs in the first place is the best way to proceed. 
I was just going to add one thing. I think, to me, I'm encouraged that there, there has to be a way to get through this, because if we look at other industries, I'd like to think that robotics aren't unique in terms of needing to figure out a way to do it. And if, even if you look at sort of an FDA-like risk-benefit analysis, there's a whole spectrum of products that that calculus comes up differently. And I guess as I was sitting, I was thinking, well, you've got on the one hand, like, blenders, microwave ovens, TVs, which have all have product liability risk, benefit, eh. and drugs, pharmaceuticals seem very much similar in terms of this analysis. We know people are going to die, but we're going to save lives in some cases, some cases not, but you can do that balance and somehow they're able to go forward. Um, and then you even have on the other end of the spectrum, guns, cigarettes, other products like that. And so if these folks can figure it out, clearly robotics people are really smart and they're good lawyers around, you, there should be a way that we can do this. So I guess I'm, I'm hopeful that. that... That's a great point, too. And, you know, one of the things that Ryan had talked about in previous years is that we could consider if, if it were a, a problem of, uh, of uh, stopping the robotics industry in its tracks before it really gets to deploy its products and save a lot of lives is having a legislative solution where uh, you say we, the robotics manufacturers have uh, an immunity from liability for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of, for certain types of risks, something like that. Um, we, I never try to uh, assume that that legislative solution will ever come to pass and try to uh, counsel people on what they could do in the absence of, of some legislation because we can't count on it ever coming to pass. But if, if it were really something that important and the risk were really that great that it could uh, nip the nascent robotics industry in the bud, then maybe the legislative solution is something that we could press as a matter of public policy. So I'm not a products liability lawyer, so I hope this isn't a really dumb question. But when I look at Ryan's questions about what makes robotics special in this and taking the point that maybe nothing truly is special about it, um, one thing I am struck by is the branch of products in the robotics area that are looking in order to connect with consumers to induce more than just um, reliance the way that your you know, oven does, the way that any of these sort of home products do. Um, and more than really just trust, but in some way trust and reliance through affection, right? So in other words, trying to, and, and you're going to think that I've got it in for your robot, but I really don't. Um, and I guess I'm wondering is if that continues successfully so that it becomes a design part of the robot to, to induce affection, at some point, does that ever become a separate aspect of product liability litigation that one could sue for loss of affection or abuse of affection, abuse of trust? My <laughs> robot broke up with me, didn't return the ring. I, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but I will leave it to you. Uh, so, uh, putting, of emotional on, distress. Yes, right. putting on my futurist hat, I would say that we, we will probably see suits kind of like that in, in, in some uh, future day. But uh, there was a discussion yesterday uh, about uh, video game addiction or addiction to, um, uh, it was probably during Ian Danforth's talk, uh, and there was actually a case filed in federal district court in the District of Hawaii against the, um, the uh, company that uh, rolled out a massively multiplayer online game, and the complaint was, your game is so good that I became addicted to it. And so, therefore, uh, I, I have claims against you. And the case was dismissed. But it, I think to go to your question, I think there will be cases that will be filed. They may be dismissed early, but we will see them. Yeah, so to, to step back to the, the car question from just two questions ago, one question ago, um, is, is the problem maybe not so much the, the worry over a big verdict? Right. I mean, because we have those. If let's say we have a, you know a million car deaths, we have verdicts in a number of those cases. The autonomous car cuts it down to half a million, and we have a verdict in a number of those cases. And it's not so much that we've increased the liability from those deaths; we've decreased it. But we're shifting the liability and aggregating it in just a few entities, right? And, and, and so. <clears throat> I mean, does that speak to what you were talking about in terms of maybe it's a legislative solution uh, that's needed? 
Well, my sense of it is that eventually the um, insurance will have a role to play. Well, yeah, I guess the, yeah. the other way, the, the private legislation insurance to, to shift the liability. I think the insurance piece of it is the insurance companies are going to try to underwrite the risk. They will charge a premium accordingly. It will raise the price of the car. That price will be spread out among all the consumers of the, the, the vehicles. And uh, there will be some probably large number of smaller cases or small cases that add up in an aggregate to an amount that needs to be taken into account when setting the premium. Uh, and those few cases, you're going to have perhaps the insurance company, uh, not the punitive damages piece, but the insurance company having to uh, take large losses. And maybe they raise the premiums as a result of that. So um, yesterday there was a question about, um, or that referred to the fact that the Parrot AR drone has a little uh, pop-up disclaimer when you launch the app. That Sorry, says, can you repeat that? I couldn't yeah, there was, a, there was a comment yesterday that the Parrot AR drone has a pop-up disclaimer when you launch the app saying, don't use this to invade anyone's privacy or anything like that. And I was curious to what extent you think um, things like end user, end user license agreements or other types of kind of general contracts can actually limit liability risk for robotics companies. For product liability or product privacy liability. related? Yeah. Could be anything. I mean, I'll, I'll let you answer. My sense is yeah. product liability less so. Well, I, I had thought, uh, or having some, some warnings that could pop up. Uh, and uh, by uh, turning on the key, you agree to these terms of service. I mean, that was the discussion at lunch yesterday that we had at our particular table. And we were saying, why aren't the auto manufacturers using click-through agreements? And the only thing we could think of is that well, they, they, they're not really in the computer business, so they're not used to doing that or not having the heads-up display or you don't want to cause people to be unable to drive, like, I got to get to my destination. I can't get through the click-through agreement to start my car, you know, because consumers would really hate that and they wouldn't buy the car. So, you know, those are some of the reasons. But if you have these computer displays and you have sort of an iPad in your car, a type of experience, there isn't any reason why companies couldn't do that. Sorry, just to interject something. Um, I mean, the economic loss doctrine says on its face that um, it does not include physical damage. Do you know what I mean? And so the courts have been, sorry, been loath to uh, uphold disclaimers of physical, of, but you can have good warning under, you know, comment J of the restatement, for instance. You could say, worry about this, and then if that happens, you can be this. But you can't say, you know, if you get cut with this knife, you can't sue us because of the economic loss doctrine. Right. So there, I think there's also there are also con the risks uh, or um, uh, consumer protection statutes that limit the types of terms that you can put into agreements, and so whatever uh, whatever uh, laws might apply would have to be taken into account when deciding what you could put on an agreement like that. Right. It's a warning. Yes. So. Sometimes, you know, there are entire websites devoted to warnings that people put on things that uh, involve risks that seem pretty obvious, but for whatever legal reasons, the counsel for those companies have said, we better put this warning on there. And uh, I, I, I think they're seeing this as a, a way of managing risk. Right. Someone kind of says, keep out of children. So I was just going to add, I think, and this is why I asked the question, I do think it's harder to disclaim liability around product liability than it is in um, software and privacy cases. I would also say there's an international difference. So Europe is much less likely to uphold disclaimers in any of those contexts, and I would imagine certainly so in product liability. Um, in the privacy case, you know, if you do get real meaningful consent, it, you probably can limit some of that liability, but how, what that needs to look like is definitely expanding. And again, there's a difference in Europe and here currently. Um, and, you know, it does need to be meaningful and transparent and probably an opt-in, particularly in Europe, for that to be upheld. Um, I have a question that I hope links up the last question and Kenneth Anderson's question before that. Um, and that is, um, I actually like, Kenneth, the way that you posed your question on Twitter, which was slightly differently, I think, right? Um, <laughs> um, 
in, in essence, the question was the same one around the idea of the exploitation of human computer action to get uh, the human to either be affection, you know, have some kind of affectionate or emotional bond um, with with the robot system, uh, and and some of the implications for that. Um, I think the way you put it on Twitter was whether, uh, in doing so and invoking something like a trust relationship, that that could somehow trigger a different approach to the liability. And I wanted to tie that also to the question about end user license agreements because in fact we've already seen uh, virtual avatars that have been used to develop uh, exactly those kind of relationships, a, a, a perceived friendship relationship where the entire premise of this chat bots which were being used um, was in fact to develop the kind of relationship where uh, the interlocutor using uh, the chatbot on an inter instant messaging platform would give all sorts of information back to the bot system. Um, and that was protected in, in essence um, through the end user license agreement which basically caused the individual using the chatbot to waive any privacy interests uh, in the bot. So this is something that Ryan Kahlo has written a fair bit about I'm also very interested in which is this question about the intentional development of trust mechanisms in the robot and their potential implications uh, for liability. So I'm wondering if you could expand on the comments you did to the previous question, but instead of thinking about pretty far off things like loss of affection, just thinking about um, the idea of exploiting something that looks like a, a friend or trust relationship in the use of a particular uh, robotic product. Um, the thing that seems to me most relevant in thinking about this is the recent hiring of Ray Kurzweil um, at Google to take search in a different direction. And I think the direction that he would have, in addition to his high ambitions about deeply semantic search, I think he does want to personify a search engine so they're more like your digital assistant or your friend who has all, who knows you better than you do and has all the answers to your questions. I wonder if you have any further comments about liability in that context. I see uh, possible risks in areas like um, the unfair competition law in California, business and professions code 17, 200 and following, and false advertising law, business and professions code section 17, 500 and following. Uh, the unfair competition law strikes at uh, unfair, illegal, or um, fraudulent practices. And if the manufacturer of the software or the, the company that's hosting the service is leading people to believe that you can have an online friend uh, or we'll, you, can, you can trust us with X, whatever it happens to be, and that promise is false, then you will have claims under those laws. And also think about whatever express warranties are being provided by the manufacturer. If it suggests that you can have a certain kind of relationship and that is a false statement, there again you could have a warranty claim. Place to stop, yeah, Ryan. this is a great place to stop and that was a, a really interesting discussion and, and, and thanks for like helping the rubber meet the road, right? That was fabulous. So but please join me in thanking everyone. <laughs>